So, Herman, is there such a thing as a textbook average human? And what are the dangers if we start to perpetuate such a thought process? Yeah. Uh, so, no, there's not, right? I, wait, 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 wait. Arithmetically, there has to be an average. So your question should have asked, is there a normal person? Well, what's uh, normal? Well, right, exactly. That's a different thing. You, there's always an average. You can always take an average. But it's what, Oh, but here's, what, so here's what I would say about that, Neil. Yeah. To push back a little. Please. Is, uh, and, and to agree with Gary, which I'm not sure if that's a good idea yet or not. You don't have permission to agree with Gary and disagree with we'll me. We'll see. We've still got a way to go. <laughs> yeah. You know, my introduction to human diversity, well, began an undergraduate in, in my coursework, but my actual physical hands-on introduction to this was dissecting a human, right? Ew, you did that? You, yeah. We were in medical school. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, would, I didn't go to medical school, but I took the medical school gross anatomy class at Harvard. And so it was me and 50 aspiring doctors you know, disassembling a person mm. uh, on these big dissection tables. And every day you show up and you get your tools out of a little case and you start taking a person apart. And, you know, mm. three months and 160 pounds of human later, you've seen everything. But what you finally, well, you know, what you learn very quickly and the reason, you know, you might think like, why do we bother doing this? It's kind of an old fashioned way to do science or to learn medicine. But the reason you do it is that you immediately learn that, you know, the, the branching of arteries through your torso as it, as it comes out from your aorta and, and starts to feed all your organs, that set of branch, that pattern of branching is not the same for everybody. And in fact, you know, often you find uh, a branching pattern in the person that you're dissecting that doesn't match any of the variants shown in your dissecting text, right? And that the nerves are the same way. And, you know, and that's just the stuff you can see with your naked eyes, right? That our diversity is down to the core. And so I would say, if you think about, if you think about uh, like a parts list for humans, right? Maybe it's, I'd be curious to think about this, but maybe it's 30,000 different parts that all kind of come together into your, to make you up. I would bet that just in the same way that there's like never been a perfect March Madness bracket, there is no human that all the pieces match a textbook dissector piece for piece. Because you might be right, you might be, the, you know, similar to the dissector on 99% of them, but there's 1% where you differ. It'll be a different dip, one percent that I differ, et cetera, et cetera. So the mathematical way to say what you just did is, whatever average you might obtain, it's not useful because the variance is so high on that average. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Because think about it. I mean, right? You can say an average, and you look for someone who matches the average, and no one does because everyone is scattered around to the left and right of the average on the chart. Hmm. So, okay, yeah. I'm with you on that. How how should that inform us? On a sociological level. Yeah. So, you know, once you start to appreciate how diversity, what it looks like, that it's sort of multidimensional, it's not just, you know, for example, skin color in this country is historically used to divide us, right, into, into different categories. And if you're black or you're white, you're thought about you're in this category or that category. If you really understand human diversity, you realize that there are sort of subtle differences across all these different modalities, you know, in terms of the way our cardiovascular systems work, digestive systems, skin, of course, sure, nervous systems, all of it. There aren't sort of neat categories that we can box people into. And I think it forces us to kind of to see diversity the way that it is, which is, again, the sort of individualized expression of these common forces, right? So it's a, it's a, an expression of our humanness, right. right? Rather than, oh, you're in this box and I'm in this box and we can kind of caricature it and pretend that we know something about you just because we put you in this particular box. That's not actually how the body works or how diversity works. Or how diversity. So uh, uh, to that point, I read a pretty cool paper out of, uh, I forget which part of Harvard, but was the basis for the predicate, there's no such thing as race. And hmm. that race is a completely manufactured construct. And it was based on what you just said, that which is, there's no box in which you can put enough people to say, this is what white is, or this is what black is. Uh, but the thing that I yep. didn't really understand was how the scientists from Korea had more in common with one of the scientists from the Netherlands than one of the other scientists from the Netherlands on a biological level. Like that, that was yeah. in the paper too? That was part of it, yeah. Oh, okay. The, the, yeah. 
So, I mean, it depends on what they're measuring, if they're measuring genetic differences or that kind of thing. But take this, here's a kind of toy example, but it's a real biological phenomenon, blood types, okay? ABO blood type, right? So I don't know if you know if you're type A or type B or type O, whatever it is. All of us in this four, the four of us sitting here might have all the same blood type, right? Maybe we're all type A. And that would mean that we have the same genetic variant. And in that way, in that particular locus, that gene, we're all more similar to each other than other people who have type B blood, all right? So in that measure, we're all a group and we're all different from somebody else. If we go by skin color, the amount of melanin in our skin, right? Well, there's differences in that, right? Who has more melanin, who doesn't have as much melanin? Um, and that might break us down differently. So there's an unlimited number of boxes that you could- Exactly, and not only that, but the, the, there aren't even hard edges on the boxes because if you look at something like skin color, in this country, we often put people into sort of black or white, but of course, skin color is everything in between too, right? So especially if you look globally, there's no, you know, you get everything from pretty dark because you have a lot of melanin in your skin to very light because you have very little and there's everything in between. So there's no hard edge where you say, okay, now I've stopped this category and I'm into that category. And, and of course, President Obama could have legitimately been declared as a white president because he's exactly half, half white. white. But by his European mother, right, right, yeah. We're, but instead, we call them a black president because of the social norms he's in exactly America. Exactly half black, right, right. Yes. So, so I, yeah. it, in in one of my books, I forgot which. He imagined him running for president in an African country as the white guy. As the white guy. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh no. Yes. That yeah. is so funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, historically, it's even crazier. Like there were people who, you know, groups who now we consider as, as sort of obviously white in the US, people from you know Ireland, people from Italy, who in the late 1800s would have been considered black. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, they weren't white until the powers that be that are, because it's a socially constructed power move to make these groups until the powers that be decided that they were in the in the white group, that mm -hmm. they became white. Until they felt outnumbered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, we, we need some help. <laughs> yeah. How'd you guys like to be white? So, Mohammed, if we look at the latitudes here on Earth, how have humans adapted in terms of their biology to survive at these different latitudes? Yeah, there's a, so that brings up an important point to start with, which is that a lot of the variation that we see in head shape, size, all the different physical characteristics we see, th th this is a, all the rage in the late 1800s was how long versus how wide oh, your phrenology. head was. Oh, phrenology. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you were yeah, dolichocephalic yeah. or brachiocephalic or yeah, all these things. Yeah, I remember that. So almost all of those kind of variations are just noise and slosh and genetic mutation that's tolerated because there's no strong selection to, to, to get rid of it, right? So a lot of the variation that we see, the superficial variation, a lot of that is just sort of tolerated noise. Now that said, there are cases where you have a strong enough selection pressure that's, that's localized and strong enough and, and long lasting for generations and generations that you get local adaptation to a particular circumstance, a particular uh, pressure. So latitude's a great one. So I have to clarify something here. Correct me if I'm wrong, Herman. When you say adaptation, you mean those who don't have the variation die, so they mm. don't propagate their genes. So no organism adapts. You're talking about the ensemble Species. statistics yep. of a generation where only some that happen to have the variation walk through the proscenium into this next world where they can survive better. Yeah, I just add to that that you can, one way to, to sort of lose that game is to die. The other way to lose that game is to not have any kids. Right. Or not okay. have as many you as your neighbor. You don't send your DNA into the future. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Pick it up. Sorry. So latitude is a great example of a pressure that's stable over time. Uh, you know, the earth has been spinning on the same, you know, the equator has been the equator for a long, long time. And it's been hot at the equator for a long, long time and colder towards the poles. And so that heat differential, for example, has shaped body shape, size and proportions. We see uh, populations near the equator that are on average, tend to be taller, thinner. People, populations near the poles tend to be a bit stockier and heavier. And that's because you wanna get rid of heat if you're in a hot environment at the equator all the time. You wanna hold on to your heat if you are towards the poles. So the physics of that, I think we have an explainer on it, mm -hmm. where if you are rounder, Mm -hmm. you are 
better insulated against losing heat because how are you going to lose heat through your skin? Through your skin, basically. Yeah. So, so the more round if, you are, yeah. And and if you ever see a pigeon in right. the winter, right, they puff they up, puff up, they're very round. Or cats when yeah, they yeah, that too. Cats yeah. do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They make themselves round and round when they're cold. And we do that too. We'll we'll bring our arms in. But the fur and, and the feathers come up and they trap a layer of air. That, that helps too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But to also try to round themselves. Whereas in the in the summer, the cat is all. Esplajau on the right. pavement. Yes, that's so true. Like, mm -hmm. and it's so funny when you look at lions; they lay stretched. Yeah. But when your cat is cold, and they're very similar, mm -hmm. they, wrap up. they yeah. wrap up. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So I just want to make sure that the listener got the physics of what you just implied. Absolutely. There. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got it. So there's a, a fun field story there. A piece of my research that kind of touched on this in a way I wasn't expecting. We do research in northern Kenya. There's a population there. They're called the Dasnich. They live with their their goats and camels and cattle. It's a pastoralist group. They're like the Maasai. You might have be more. They're more. You know, you might have heard of the Maasai. It's a similar kind of yeah. population. And we started work there in 2017. And we were talking to one of the uh, NGOs, the charities that had set up shop in this little village called Illaret. There's this German uh, charity. We're talking to the the head of the charity, and because you know we wanted to get a sort of health and nutrition research project started, we thought we should talk to people who have been doing health and nutrition sort of outreach. And he said, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible here. Everybody, all the kids, you know, 70% of the kids are malnourished here. And we thought, oh my gosh, that is really, that is terrible. And so we kind of thought about that and kept that in our, our minds. As, and as we're kind of visiting that village and the surrounding villages, it doesn't square though with what we're seeing because these kids don't look malnourished. These kids are running around, happy, laughing, you know, families are big. Um, people look healthy. And so we thought if they say that they're malnourished, then that's important to know. But that seems, you know, counterintuitive based on just interacting with this population. Fast forward a couple of years, we've got ourselves a big data set on thousands of children who've been measured from the day they're born every few months to the time they're five or six years old. And what you can see when you look at these kids' heights and weights is that they're born around the same size as all the other kids on, in the world. And then they start to, their weight starts to fall off a little bit, but their height goes, grows fast, right? So they're, by the time they're three, four years old, kids in this population are taller than three or four year olds in most of the rest of the world because they have been adapted. That population has been adapted to be tall and thin. And so this German charity was looking at the ratio of weight, which was the same as everywhere else, maybe a little bit low, to height, which was tall because they were adapted to be tall, that ratio looked bad. It made them look malnourished, too thin, too light. They're just skinny. Height. They're just skinny, but they're built, they're, they're actually, they are built to be skinny. So once again, they're not, there's a European bias brought into Africa yep. to pass judgment on who's there. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that'll be awesome. And these are folks so, that, so had that, the that, Kenyan that, anthropologists gone to Germany, they would say, y'all <laughs> some fat ass folk. Right. Thank you.